Okay, in that case, I'd like to welcome Adam Weir, who's going to talk about the study that Bruce was referring to, and that's the value of MR scan in determining return to play. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks a lot Celeste for the introduction and thanks a lot for the invitation to speak here today. Uh, I'm Adam Weir, I'm, I'm a sport medicine physician, not a radiologist, doing a talk on MRI scans. So the talk is a little bit about my perspective as a sports medicine physician. How can I use MRI in clinical practice? Uh, what's the clinical utility to me? Um, the take home message, uh, I've got 10 minutes so I thought I'd just come straight in with the take home message uh, and I'm very glad Bruce uh, that we're aligned on this that uh, I feel that the, the MRI is actually overrated or it's gained an undue position in sports medicine uh, when we talk about its use in predicting the time to return to play or in predicting re-injuries and I'll spend the next nine minutes trying to show you some data to back up this statement why MRI? Uh, how has it become so prominent in high-level sports? I think it's a beautiful examination. The advances in technology, we've just gone from one and a half Tesla to three Tesla in Aspatar. The, the pictures are beautiful. Uh, and I think everybody enjoys to have their pathology or injury shown to them visually in a graphic way so you have an idea that we can see inside your body and in some way that's going to give us additional information. We can grade uh, MRIs of acute hamstring injury in a reliable fashion. A nice study by Bruce uh, himself, the radiologist and the rehabilitation department in Aspatar showing an excellent reliability. So in that sense it's a good tool to use because we can use it reliably. Uh, as Bruce said, when we want to know about the, the clinical utility of any test, the starting point should be to perform a systematic review, uh, which we did over the last two years. Uh, Bruce has already uh, given you the main, uh, the main findings, but just to go a little bit more in detail on that, when we looked at the evidence, we found 12 studies done until date, and 11 of those 12 studies have a very high risk of in the study. Uh, why could this be? In general, I think the battery might be dying. You, can you still hear me? Yeah, okay. Uh, in general, there's no blinding use. So both the athletes who've undergone the MRI and the team who's looking after the athletes are not blinded to the results. So they will know this is a grade one, two or three injury. And obviously, I think this will influence how you treat the, the athlete. The majority of the studies have just looked at MRI data on its own without including data on the physical examination, as if the patient just came in, told you he had a hamstring strain, you put him in the MRI without examining him, and then uh, did your prediction on return to play uh, based only on the MRI findings and nothing of clinical examination. And this is actually not the way we like to work in reality. The main conclusion of the, the review is that there's no strong any evidence for any MRI finding being able to predict the return to play time. Uh, there is moderate evidence, as, Gru as Bruce said, for a grade zero injury being quicker and the central tendon proximally taking a longer time to return to play. If we look uh, Again, the, the nice uh, scientific curves coming up. Um, when we want to make a prediction in clinical practice, what we want for an athlete, uh, for a team, is to be able to make a prediction based on a narrow confidence interval. So be able to say to a player, this is going to take you between 17 and 21 days. That's a useful prediction. And the enemy of this accurate prediction is variance. Uh, when we look at the UEFA data, Bruce referred to this already, they've done a fantastic job in gathering huge numbers uh, over many years and this gives us a lot of insight. And what we see 
uh, is that if we look at the data based on grade one injuries, so only edema and no fiber disruption, that the 95% the confidence interval around that will be from zero to 37 days. Grade two uh, is from two to 42 days. So not, don't pay particular attention to the days, but just that idea that Bruce showed us with the three curves, yes, they are a little bit different, but there's a huge degree of overlap. I think that's the main message that we should take from this. How about studies where we have a combination, a combination of clinical examination data and MRI data? I was lucky and fortunate to be involved in a randomized control trial that we performed on the use of platelet-rich plasma in acute hamstrings injuries. So these are players coming in within a first week of injury. They had a baseline history examination and MRI performed. After this, they underwent a placebo injection or a PRP injection. The PRP was not effective. There was no difference in the time to return to play between the groups. So after the study, we pulled the data together and just looked at the predictive ability of history, examination, or MRI to tell us about the time to return to play of the athletes. In this study, there are 74 athletes. These are all having a grade one or grade two injury. That was an inclusion criteria for the randomized control trial. Um, and we looked at which of the baseline parameters, history, examination findings, or MRI, would enable us to predict the time to return to play. And the two parameters that came out as being useful was self-prediction by the athlete. So at the end of taking the history, before they took off their trousers and were examined, we just asked them, how long do you think this is going to take? That was the single strongest predictor. And the second predictor that came out was a, a flexibility deficit. None of the MRI, either categorical or continuous variables, were able to add anything onto that. Aspartar data, uh, I know both Nicola and Philip will be covering this in more detail, but again, a similar picture. There's data now on 180 athletes who had baseline examination and a baseline MRI at the time of the injury. When we look how much of the variance, so you imagine the big curve, how much of that variance can we explain when we look at baseline physical examination? You can explain 29% of that based on the physical examination. How much additional explanation of that variance do you get by adding in MRI? It's 3% more on top of that. Uh, so that's what, what it's telling us at the point when you've already examined them, you perform an MRI after that. It's giving you 3% more explanation of the variance. So I think we can safely say that I agree with Bruce that the, the role of MRI in predicting uh, the return to play time is limited. How about re-injuries? Because that's the other important aspect. Could it give us some information on recurrence? The first question we have to ask ourselves should be, uh, should we wait until the MRI is normal? Uh, a study that we did a while ago, 53 athletes who were returning to play, they've been clinically cleared to go back to play. Uh, what we saw in that group is that 89% still have edema and one third have fibrosis. Uh, so I think we can safely say that MRI at the time of return to play, it's not normal. And then the question is, is this edema or fibrosis or scar tissue, would this be predictive of a re-injury? So we have a study on this. Uh, this is 64 athletes who were in the Dutch randomized study. Uh, they were examined once they've been cleared by their treating physiotherapist to go back to play by an independent observer who did physical exam and we recorded a new MRI at the time when they went back to playing. Within the following year, 27% of the 64 athletes had a re-injury. Uh, and when we look at the physical examination parameters and MRI parameters, which is predictive, which would be predictive of those having a re-injury, that's having had a previous injury, having a flexibility deficit, having a force deficit, 
and a feeling of discomfort on palpation. So not actual pain, but they just say, hmm, I still feel something. Uh, so these were the ones to look out for, I think, in clinical practice. These are the athletes at higher risk. In this study, we didn't have enough subjects to have good power to know about the role of fibrosis. So we've worked on another study where we now have 108 athletes who had an MRI at baseline at the time of injury and when they go back to play again. At the time they're going back to play, 38% have developed a new fibrosis and we have one year follow-up data on these athletes. Uh, if you have fibrosis when you return to play, 24% of the athletes sustained a re-injury. If you have no fibrosis at the time of return to play, 24% of the athletes sustained a re-injury. So I think, I hope with these data to be able to uh, perhaps convince you MRI, it's beautiful, uh, it gives us a very nice representation of the, the injury and we can do it in a reliable fashion but never be tempted to forget uh, clinical examination and don't underestimate clinical, don't overestimate the MRI. So if I was to try and summarize it in one talk, I think at the minute we have clear data to say that clinical examination is vastly superior to MRI in, being allow in allowing us to estimate time to return to play and predict re-injury but we don't like conflict, so moving forward, we need to keep working on studies like this where we combine radiology uh, and clinical to get to the bottom of this. As Bruce said, we have a long way to go, uh, and only by doing these kind of studies will we be able to advance the field. Just like to thank my uh, co-authors on a lot of the, the, the Dutch papers, especially to Goos Roerink, uh, there, who's a PhD student uh, who worked very hard on the platelet-rich plasma study. So a big shout out to them and uh, thanks to everybody for listening. Any other questions? Can I ask a question to you, Adam? Um, one of the most interesting findings in your study about predictors for return to play was the patient's own subjective perception. And to my mind, that would mean either that they're really in tune with their body or that psychology is far more important than we think. What are your ideas about this? Um, I, first, I was really glad that it came out in the analysis that that was important because I was the one who was really keen to have the question in there in the first place because I always had the idea when you have a, an elite athlete or an experienced athlete in front of you, it would be foolish to not ask their opinion uh, about things. I think the risk is there's a definite also bias because if he or she has in her head this is going to take me about 20 days or should take me about 20 days, maybe they make sure it does take around 20 days in terms of how quickly they progress. Um, but I, I would like to think it's more related to that they have a good body awareness uh, and they've, especially when you get a little bit further on in your career, you've normally had a few injuries as you go along in both either football or handball. And I think you have a good, good feeling when you pull something, oh, this is nothing too major, or this is really, really hurting, and it feels like it's going to take me a long time. And uh, the same with return to play. For me, when an athlete's going back to play, if you have a good relationship with them, one of the most important things is their confidence, I think, do they feel ready? And it's an extremely subjective measurement, if you like, but their readiness and confidence to return to play is for me also extremely important in clinical practice. <laughs>